Welcome back to the Quantum Guide Show. Today in episode 156, I'm very happy to bring on a new guest, Ra Castaldo. Ralph Anthony Castaldo, otherwise known as Ra Castaldo, is a world-renowned researcher, seer, songwriter, remote viewer, artist, creator, author, licensed Reiki healer, and an all-around Renaissance man. He has spent several decades uncovering the truth behind the biggest mysteries of life, nature, and the universe. Ra not only helps countless people with knowledge and research, he also does crystal skull psychic readings and even creates his own copper and gemstone healing products for the mind, body, and soul. You can find his products at the mysticalspiralstore.com and his free information website at themysticalspiral.com. Ra also does his own radio show, podcasts, and has the most incredible Patreon found at patreon.com, The Mystical Spiral. To find out more about Ra Castaldo, and um, all of the links are featured down below in the description. Check us out, subscribe to our channels, leave us comments, and like our videos. So today we're going to learn about plasma physics and how this ties into the ancients. Hi, Ra. How you doing? Hey, Karen. Thank you for taking me uh, on your show. And we'll, we'll take you down, guys, a very interesting path. And I, I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of thought-provoking information for people to maybe maybe that they haven't even heard before. Maybe they rethink some of the things that they've heard before. Oh, wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. I'm, and I appreciate you coming so much. So um, let's start off with the folks that aren't familiar. Uh, maybe you could tell them a bit about what is plasma physics? Well, um, I think it's very archaic the way we look at space and the way we look at stars and suns. So, I mean, they have heliophysicists that study the sun and plasma physics is basically, you know, studying space plasma, space water basically is what 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 it kind of is, you know, it's very similar to a watery, but more, not, not water, what we think of as earth, but the way it flows through space is very similar to water, the way information streams and the way it's coming from sun. So the, the way we look at, so, so everybody can basically understand it, like, cause I've spent a, a few years researching plasma physics, space physics, astronomy, um, the last five years, plasma astrophysics, and before that, I've been interested in astronomy since I'm since I'm young. So, um, probably over thirty years in astronomy, and the last five years of of plasma physics. So, the old way we look at at stars and suns is pretty archaic. Like we're taught in school that us this like the stay our solar system. We'll take our solar system for instance. The sun in our solar system is a, a hydrogen gas sphere, right? Well, even NASA will admit now on their website, you'll see that it, now I'm not saying that NASA gives us all the truth, but not everything is fake. Not not everything is fake. So NASA will even admit that actually the, the sun is so hot that it's not actually hydrogen gas. It's plasma. Right. So all suns and stars are there's streams of plasma coming from them. So plasma is basically the lifeblood of the universe right it's everywhere when most people look at space right karen when like you'll think when most people look at space they think that it's mostly empty right yeah they think it's a yeah. vacuum right so that's actually not true actually 99.99 percent of the matter in space is plasma it's everywhere it's connecting everything it's the lifeblood it's interconnecting nebulas uh, strings of galaxies, universes, maybe like it's it's literally the lifeblood that's interconnecting everything. It's the Akasha records. It's the Akashic records of of uh, all suns and stars are like rivers of plasma information flowing from them. This information has to do with creation, uh, sustenance, um, evolution, and dissolution. Right. All the all the qualities of the universe, destruction, creation, evolution. Right. So every sun and star that's emitting these rivers of streams of information 
they form a confluence of one big celestial ocean, right? Now, this is talked about in all mythology, right? All mythology talks about celestial seas. You got to pay the Grim Reaper to cross the, 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 the river, right? All, I mean, it's everywhere, everywhere. This is not just a poetic symbol of the afterlife. This is deep secrets of nature and the universe that has been imprinted on our genetic memory that we're carrying over through folk tales and mythologies and oral traditions. But it's the deep sequences of, of all science and the universe, right? So plasma physics is basically the creation, destruction, rebirth, evolution of, of the universe. It's, it's how every information is transported from the sun to its planets, right? So the, each sun is, is like a computer, right? And, and there's various multidimensional levels of life that it affects, right? All the way down to the quantum level, right? Nothing can escape the sun. It's the ultimate judge and God of the solar system. There's no escaping the sun. It's the ultimate God of mythology. And every keeps the cycles of time. Right. It's the solar year. It's it's it keeps our time. It, it does everything. So plasma physics is involved in the in the very reason why we're here. Uh, you know, plasma, the streams of plasma that come forth from the sun is the solar wind. That that solar wind is 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 what forms the magnetosphere around our planet. Life can't live without a magnetosphere like that we have. So like plasma is literally creating and forming clouds of creation around things. And it's like, it's literally the, it's, it's, and we can get into, it. it's in every mythology. When they, when they talk about Zeus or even Yahweh or Baal, all these gods riding on clouds, right? They're, they're talking about, you know, plasma. They're talking, it's, it's everywhere. So uh, from experiences that I had, it led me down this path to exploring the waters of space, the celestial oceans, and how it's connected to the inner sun worlds of, of our existence. Like when, when we go into our own telepathic self, we are connected to streams of worlds, streams of data. That's the celestial ocean that we're, we only can detect with certain instruments now, but our telepathic eye can, can also see this, right? Can also detect this. And, um, you know, I actually was born still inside the call caul is the amniotic sac mm -hmm. so i was actually born still in that water you know when i came out my my mother's water never broke what they call is being born behind the veil so when i was born i was still in that original womb water inside this realm for a little bit of time right so some people that are born that way do sort of receive a, a higher sensitivity to things and seem to be connected to the cosmos in a very interesting way and receive, uh, you know, all sorts of telepathic psychic activity, you know, all the time. Like, and not everybody born that way does have that, but it's unfortunately been a curse and a blessing in some ways yeah. throughout my whole life, you know? So uh, they actually, in all traditions, talk about this call birth as being very mystical and shamanic and whole traditions were focused around these these people like they were they were looked at as seers it's talked about as being the the ultimate veil of isis right or the net of neath you know uh you know fishing the baby out of the cosmic water right the net of neath the veil of isis so it's it's talked about in, in mystical traditions you know going back thousands of years that that babies even born that way will have a deeper connection to things like that so it's it's quite possible that that's my you know it's it's been since birth that I've been having these experiences but as I've gone on my journey I had a near death experience when I was 9 mm -hmm. that sort of led me to start researching uh space because I I I left my body and I was outside of this this earth so after I had an experience like that it was uh I was off to the races on on finding some answers. I needed answers. Mm -hmm.
So I hope I gave you a little bit of an answer of plasma physics and also gave you how I ended up researching such deep topics because it's it's not it's I had a background growing up in mythology just from you know the 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 family I've been in and and uh my interests and sort of things that I've learned growing up from different stories and and things like that. So my whole life pretty much since I'm a kid has been involved with cosmologies of certain cultures and mythologies of certain cultures and then i once i realized that they're describing some of the deep sciences and secrets of nature like mm -hmm. in the ancient vedic writings um then i started to really go in it led me into the directions of researching plasma because mm -hmm. so like i was describing my near-death experience for many years and mm -hmm. i i wasn't using the word plasma for a long time until i actually got more into the plasma physics and i realized that you know that that's actually what the water was that i was encountering you know mm -hmm. interesting so plasma physics is really the understanding of how plasma is in um is interrelated with our physical universe and it sort of explains how things work on a very high level and, and yeah i mean plasma a lot of a lot of plasma physics is mathematics as well right yes so yes. i'm not giving you the mathematical no we probably wouldn't understand it anyway yeah. to be honest with you i wouldn't yeah. anyway Maybe but to describe other... it in a in a physical way where everybody can understand you know right. it's literally like water flowing and you know when we get into the coronal mass ejections and all the information that the sun is sending out yeah the electrons and it's and and how it makes a chorus you know and all this like there's literally a, a harmony of spheres how they described it in the past is more correct than what most scientists describe it as today. Well, I think science today is extremely limited by ideologies that that um, may sound fancy and good to certain learned people, but I don't think they're based in reality. And I, I can see that we could make a whole, whole different show all about that. But um, I also wanted to tell the viewers and the listeners, it's my understanding that plasma is the fourth state they do matter. matter. Yeah. So there's liquid, there's uh, solids, solids, there's gases um, and, gas, and plasma. And yeah. Then there's plasma. And so yeah. when we're getting, um, we get these um, um, solar winds, but also coronal mass ejections from our sun. We're getting it quite a lot uh, recently. It's affecting our um, magnetosphere or magnetopause, depending on what you want to call it. But isn't that even tied into the, the shifting of the pole? Because like the North Pole used to be in Canada and it's now over Siberia. My understanding is as that tilts, the South Pole also tilts and the equator actually moves from where we've understood it to be, to be also tilted between the two poles. So everything yeah, is being it, affected right now. Yeah, well, actually the 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 solar flares that we're getting currently right now it's uh from a new active region on the sun but those solar flares for some reason aren't generating and being connected to coronal mass ejections not all solar flares connect to coronal mass ejections but most do for some reason this dynamic region right now that's doubling in size constantly and now it's bigger a couple of times bigger than earth there's other spots that are way big like huge Right. So they come from these sunspots, which uh, is talked about in ancient writings as well. Like when they talk about the spotted cow, you know, the solar spotted cow of ancient Vedic. I mean, that's that's that they're talking about sunspots, you know, and that's where the information is coming from. The coronal mass ejections is coming from. So those coronal mass ejections, they are basically spiraling loops of electrons that are are thrown out like a noose from the sun. Right. And um, depending on the strength of them, they can obliterate our magnetic field, open up holes, you know, for auroras to come through. And the magnetic magnetic tail inside the magnetosphere is what pulls in some of the like that information and it gets all chaotic in there. And then it breathes out like a fire breathing dragon, uh, all the auroras. Right. So um, usually the electrons and all that just the cosmic radiation that bounces off the magnetic shield but some of it comes in and when it comes in it even makes sounds right before dawn usually uh that sound just like certain birds like the hoopoe bird the woodpecker bird uh mm -hmm. the cuckoo bird 
birds like this. And this is a, a frequency that helps plant cells open up the stomata plant cell, all, all things like that. And the birds seem to mimic this sound and help nature flow and evolve and be vibrant. It's, it's so, a harmony all coming from the sun. And they talk yeah. about it in mythology. I mean, uh, from Zeus to everybody, you know, with the woodpecker and the cuckoo bird. I mean, it's it's all over. It's all over sacred sites and all that. Yep. And, you know, in modern day, we're taught to be afraid of the sun and cover yourself with uh, um, stuff to block out the rays and stay out of the sun and wear big hats. And and yet um, it's it's a it's an integral integral part of our reality and keeping everything functioning and healthy and in balance on this planet. Now, I got a question for you. I hope this isn't a side topic, but I'm an old person and I remember the sun for many, 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 many years. It, it was, was a different color. color. It was yellow and mm -hmm. you could actually watch it. You could stare at it for a, a couple of seconds before you looked away and then you'd see spots. The sun today is white. It's much bigger. You cannot look at it, not even for one second. It's way yeah. too bright. What's going on with that? Well, at different times of the day, it'll be different colors. It's not always white. It's not always white. There's some times where you'll see it. It's a different, different. But it seems that, you know, the sun goes through cycles. There's times yeah. where, so, you know, there's probably times in history where it's been, it's been more bright and things like that. But uh, yeah, the sun is good. The sun goes through evolutionary changes depending on the vibrations that we put out as well. Mm -hmm. So everything is interconnected. You know, all energies are are formed out amongst the stars, and they're drawn in by the sun in each solar system. Right? Those energies are drawn in. Right? So certain energies that are drawn in by the sun, then the sun emanates them back out to the planet right then the planets alter those emanations by their own vibrations and then send them back out right mm -hmm. right when we say prayers when we have thoughts all our emanations are altered by the light that we receive and then they come back out and mm -hmm. then the moon receives them and then it comes it comes back like all and then it's all interconnected so depending on all the vibrations of specific planets it alters the sun as well. It alters the sun in our solar system. So depending on the activity and, and, you know, the, the life forces, you know, the, the different, the, the different vibrations of the activities that's happening within the solar system, it's going to change the sun significantly. So when our sun is chaotic, I, I guarantee you, it has to do with the activity in our solar system the very thoughts that are being generated out in our solar system. I truly believe that the universe is the brain of God, mm -hmm. right? So all sentient life from earth to all other planets with life on it throughout the whole universe, right? As thoughts are generated, depending on the power and the focus of those thoughts, what it could be a whole group of people, you know, chanting and doing a spiral dance mantra with a focused thought at a specific sun or star, depending on the power of thoughts that are generated, particles start exciting in the universe. They start interacting and calling one another. They start banging together and creation starts happening. So we, our life, life everywhere, all sentient life creates planets, creates stars, creates life all over. That's what the particles in space do. Therefore, sentient life to start creating things. So when new stars form, it's it's new new things are being generated from activity within sentient life in the universe. And I truly believe that. So we're a small little section in the brain of God. You know, all the little uh, dendrites and synapses and and neurons and all the stuff that we got going on in in our brain is like say like comets shooting across the galaxy meteors flying around you know uh supernova explosions when we have an idea you know or, or or you know things like that it's the same thing even down to crystals i mean you can look at certain crystals here that have actual dendrites look at that mm -hmm. yes actual dendrites right Den dendritic trees in them i mean so that's why unfortunately people start to see patterns and faces and everywhere and some people will look and look, 
there's mud fossils every no it's not it, I, not everything is body parts everywhere right that's not true that's actually pretty false but all life is making similar patterns everywhere right all life whether it's human life a snail, a, a octopus, or a seaweed, whatever. Similar patterns and structures are developed. It's sacred geometry. Our body is sacred geometry. So we're going to see similar shapes and faces in everything that we see out mm -hmm. there. It's just, you know, there's where each one of us is an individualized pattern in the matrix. It's all about different patterns on the matrix. It, it breaks down to basically the ma and the pa. Right. Mother and God, uh, mother, father, the, the, the matron, the patron, right. The ma, the pa. So when you have ma and pa, you have the ma, the matron or the matrix, right. The, 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 the womb of the mother, right. The matrix, or you have pa, the patron, the pattern, right. So it's all the pattern on the matrix. That's everything. The ma and the pa. That's all we are is just patterns in the matrix. Wow. So, yeah, we should not let anyone else for dictate our individualized pattern, right? We all are a creative, individualized pattern of a being. And unfortunately, we let other people, whether it's media, whether it's this, whether it's that, dictate our individualized pattern. Mm -hmm. Most of us have all of these, if you telepathically view somebody, You'll see like a computer screen, a holographic screen in front of you and all these little windows of these patterns that people have developed in their life that are detrimental to them. And yeah. it's stuck all over us, each yeah. one of us, from me to you to everyone, right? And these yeah. these patterns are, they make up who we are. Yeah, if we, if we buy into it, but, you know, we can also, I think, escape that. Now, I just want to go back a little bit and ask you, if the sun... If it's normal for the sun or healthy for the sun to go through cycles, when it's going through a cycle, is the solar system also going through a cycle? And is the earth also going um, um, yeah. through a oh, cycle? For sure. So it's all tied, everything's tied into for sure. including so our we, bodies, we... our minds, our spirituality. Yep. So we really are going through a, a bit of a shift right now. For sure, on every level. And in fact, like when we go into like a minimum sunspot cycle, this is when we are being seeded with new viruses, new bacterias, new life, new evolution for, for the beings and, and creatures and, and plants, everything that lives on this planet, right? So when we go into a minimum sunspot cycle, it's like an open invitation for places that there's breakthroughs in the stratosphere. And I'll explain that in a minute. Places that there's breakthroughs in the stratosphere, when we go into a minimum sunspot cycle, it's like open invitation in those places for anything that's lurking in the stratosphere to come on in. And what do I mean by lurking in the stratosphere? I mean millions and millions and millions and millions of gallons of cometary debris, dust, bacterias that's in there. Because when comets have frozen bacteria inside of them, Right. And then when they start going in, traveling towards the sun, the sun activates their plasma tail, yeah. which is, you know, lets out all that bacteria that's been frozen inside there for how however long, millions of years sometimes. And they could be interstellar bacteria. Right. So that gets swept to the planets by the solar wind and spills on into the planets when there's minimum sunspot cycle. So we have all sorts of particles, bacteria, viruses, all of that stuff lurking in our stratosphere. And certain spots on our planet have breakthroughs in the stratosphere. And when we go into a minimum sunspot cycle, like we did in December of 2019, right? Places where there's a breakthrough in the stratosphere, it just comes right on in. One of those places that we have a huge breakthrough in the stratosphere is in the Himalayan mountains. The Himalayan mountains is situated where it punches a hole in the stratosphere that forms a funnel drainage route for everything that's in the stratosphere. And it sweeps on in. And the first places it goes is Hong Kong and China. 
Interesting. So I'm wondering if the virus that we're not allowed to talk about is exactly. tied into that. Yeah, and they probably even took it into a lab and 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 messed with it. But yeah, this is why they say that Shiva sits on the top of Mount Kailash on the Himalayan mountains and he's doing the dance of fertility and destruction because he's bringing in all the cosmic DNA. It's coming in right on that spot. Right? Right? And and the 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 Sanskrit language, even the very Vedic war, if you look into the origins of the Vedic war that split all these bloodlines, that ended up being the Persians, the Assyrians, the Hittites, the Mitanni, all these uh, all these groups, right? They emerged after there was a flood and a and a, and a actually a, a, most likely there was a solar event that led to uh, uh, destruction on the planet that led to all sorts of things. Maybe even comets came, uh, tsunamis, but there was some sort of destruction on the planet. What re-emerged from the ancient Vedic knowledge was the Persians, the Egyptians, the Assyrians, all of that. But originally, there was an ancient Vedic war with the Asura and the Deva bloodlines. These are the, the origins of the Nephilim that people talk about today. These are the ancient original bloodlines that people relate to Mu and Lemuria and Atlantis and all. They were ancient Vedic Aryan Sanskrit that's what the ancient bloodlines are, the Asura and the Deva clans, right? So their ancient Vedic war, if you really look into the origins of the war, it was over the spotted cows. Now, what does that mean? The spotted cows that they were fighting over actually means the rays of the sun. They were literally fighting over how they were harnessing and using the actual solar energy and information that they were harnessing and using from the sun. So they were literally harnessing and, and using cosmic and solar energy for telepathic means, for spiritual means, for physical means, all sorts of means, right? So they were harnessing that energy and using it to rule as God, some of these, these, these bloodlines, right? Yeah. So they went to a war about the rays of the sun, about the information they were harnessing and using from the sun. Also, they were trying to extend the light to achieve immortality beyond time, beyond this physical dimension, right? So they were striving to achieve the knowledge of immortality through the sun. And they were fighting over the rays of the sun, literally over the sun. That's what the Vedic war was over. So they also say that the very Sanskrit language was developed off making the sounds of the, of the solar system. Right? It's, it's developed off the sound of Shiva's cosmic drum, which ultimately is the sun. Right. Even if you look at the sun, it looks like the face of a of a drum. Right. Mm -hmm. The drum skin. Right. It and it's mm -hmm. it's beating the solar year. It's keeping the time of the solar year. It's Shiva's cosmic drum. And if you think about a, a cosmic drum, it's externally powered. A drum is externally powered and it's energized at its surface, just like the sun. That the sun is not technically the sun is, yes, internally powered, they say. But actually, there's plasma flowing, too and from so it has plasma coming to it and energizing its surface and forming chaotic chaotic things so it, it literally we have to take a whole new look at the sun it, the old way we're looking at it is completely archaic and it it it's we're going to see in the future that our magnetosphere and all the magnetospheres around planets that have life is a region that is a a, a stargate it's a gateway for souls to travel on Mm -hmm. And a gateway into the solar wind plasma akashic field network that we have. Hi guys, break time for a short message. YouTube will not monetize me. So if you enjoy my content and want to support my efforts, help me to cover my expenses by visiting my shop to buy yourself a beautiful organ generator. Zendome's Organite are my unique brand and they are ethically sourced handmade and double charged for maximum effect. They are only available through my website www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com. Many people are finding comfort with Zendome's organ generators, commonly called Organite. They are a simple compound which balance ambient energy by converting negative energy and EMF into positive healing energy with many easily confirmed health benefits. 
They are a simple compound with alchemic and energetic properties. These devices function as self-driven, continuously operating, highly efficient, negative to positive energy transmutation factories. They help diminish the harmful effects of electromagnetic frequency radiation by attracting and converting negative energies, retuning them into new and more healthful sound and light wave patterns, and they help to purify the atmosphere and accelerate plant growth. They also help stimulate positive mood and are a natural remedy for poor sleep patterns. When organite is within range of any corded or wireless electronic device, it will efficiently and continuously transform that energy into orgone as it is being transmitted. This essentially creates orgone energy transmitters out of any and all emitters of harmful negative energy. You can use these devices for focusing the mind, healing, meditation, and for spiritual growth. Zendome's Organite are my unique brand of organ generators, and they are only available through my website. Don't be fooled by imitations. Check out my website to see my latest selection at www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com. That's K-A-R-E-N-H-O-L-T-O-N healthcoach.com. Check them out today. Now, let's get back to the show. Yes, and I've understood, um, you can tell me if I have this wrong, but from watching um, some different video presentations where you're talking about it, back, back, back in the old Vedic days, there was no separation between the spiritual, the medical, the warrior, yeah. the learned, the scholar. It was like a, well, sort of a unified... Yeah, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately we today, Karen, we keep spirituality over here and science over here yeah but they're not but meant to be separate they're fused together they're one in the same right mm -hmm. when you were an adept in in the ancient times you were a, sci a scientist a doctor an astronomer a shaman and a freaking warrior all of that in one those were the adepts right and all of those sacred sciences were fused together they weren't kept separate. Nowadays, we completely keep things separate. And we've developed a technology that's taking the place of us. We've developed technology out of artificial materials. And we've made these artificial materials so they can, so we can sit back and let the technology work for us. In the past, we were using natural materials like stone mm -hmm. on sacred sites and things like this. And we were using natural elements to harness solar, stellar, cosmic energy. So we were part of the technology and we were spiritually evolving with nature and the universe as one. Mm -hmm. But then we got greedy and materialism, the power of this realm, right? We, we, we started to be greedy. And that developed us making technology so we can sit back and rule as gods. And the technology took place and, 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 and formed a thing of its own, right? So nowadays, instead of us being telepathic, we have instant messaging, mm -hmm. right? Things like that, mm -hmm. right? In the past, we led a certain life where we were in tune with where we were in the nat in, in nature and our surroundings, surroundings. Mm -hmm. So we can sense the vibrations and communicate with others in the network, right? Nowadays, we oh. don't want to have that sort of oneness with nature. It's too hard work for us. So we, we'd rather instant message everybody instead of trying to be telepathic and and being finding our place in nature. So instead of uh, us being a part of the technology and holding the technology within, we've now gone to an external source of technology. And the more we rely on that external source, the more our internal sources atrophy, they're not being used, not to mention yeah. all the toxic elements on this planet. Um, you know, that uh, shut down our pineal gland and shut down our ways of, of knowing and our ancient wisdoms. Uh, I agree 100%. Now, let's yeah, go back. Like, so the, 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 be the way I describe it is that the solar, solar knowledge, the solar cosmic energies are literally connected to the spinal current of humanity. Mm -hmm. Now, think about that sentence for a second. 
-hmm. right? The cosmic energies are literally connected to the spinal current of humans, mm -hmm. right? But we're, we're now cut off. We're, we're like kept in a prison of technology. That's like a sludge of a net, a net of sludge around our planet. Right. So we're just getting little trickles of that divine light that we're catching little trickles instead of that divine ocean completely flowing through to our spinal current. Mm -hmm. Right. We have to open those floodwaters again. And when the sun opens those floodwaters, they remove the evil on the planet. And unfortunately, the evil has to do with the thoughts of mankind as well. Oh, yes. Right. So mm -hmm. it, it revived. And that's what the coronal mass ejections are described that even in the Vedas. So I was shown working at megalithic sites, the true origins of many of our symbols, even shown that many of the dynasties were misusing these symbols. They didn't even know. Mm -hmm. Right. So the Vedics, they have the coronal mass ejection loop described as the Pasha. You will, sh you will see the, the Pasha held by Varuna. Varuna is the God of the solar ocean. So when you see a, a Varuna with multiple arms and he's the God of the sun, more specifically, the God of the sun's ocean, all his various arms are the whirling vortex of the sun. And each arm is holding another attribute of the sun. And one of, you know, and one of the arms is holding a loop, a coronal loop. And that loop is described as a pasha. And at that pasha, the very definition of it is a golden noose that lassos souls and pulls them into the celestial waters. I mean, what a beautiful way to describe a coronal mass ejection, opening up a doorway in the magnetosphere for souls to travel on, right? For souls to leave our planet, it has to also pass through our magnetic shield, right? There's only holes in our magnetic shield in certain designated spots. More specifically, the biggest holes are in the North Pole and the South Pole. That's where most of the auroras come in, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Karen, how can it be coincidentally that this is the spot that's called the celestial ship of the north, where the virgin mother goddess, uh, you know, standing over and all the souls travel and in and, and, and all the mythologies and in all the ancient writings, they're telling souls to go towards the circumpolar north stars and travel into the, the celestial waters. I mean, that's exactly where as well that we have mandalas of light mandala patterns of light that change depending on the, the day, the, the vibrations. We have mandalas of light that are ancient mandalas that were installed here by ancient sages long ago during Atlantis, Lemurian, these ancient cultures, right? Nobody is really fully connected to these mandalas of light anymore. Some of us get trickles of information from it, but we have huge pattern, mandala patterns of light that are between earth and the stars, right? In between, like where the magnetosphere is, over the North Pole, we have a huge mandala of light that vibrates and, and sends us different images and thoughts and all sorts of things that all of us pick up on and don't realize where they're coming from. By working with some of the crystals and crystal skulls that I've, 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 I've worked with, I was shown these mandalas of light and how to connect to them as well and receive information from the sun, wisdom from the sun. Mm -hmm. And wisdom doesn't just come because you're interested in it. You have to go to battle for it. You have to go to battle for it. So it's taking me over 30 years just to receive a little bit of real sacred knowledge. If you would have asked me 10 years ago what the Ankh of Egyptian meant, mm -hmm. I would have not had the right answer. I would have been wrong, right? But now I understand that it is the coronal mass ejection loop, is the coronal loop. That's the true origins of the Ankh. I mean, it's the most logical. Everything else is ridiculous that somebody says. Mm -hmm. I mean, Karen, look at this, all right? Now you have, this is a famous Akhenaten 
mural. Uh, uh, this is a papyrus from the, the Cairo. Uh, this is a from bought from the the Cairo Museum. It's a a replica papyrus of one of the real ones, right? Mm -hmm. So this is of the later 18th dynasty of Akhenaten, who is the son of Amenhotep the Third and the father of Tutankhamun. And he's got his wife here and his child. So obviously these are solar kings. They're solar dynasties. So a solar king, a solar dynasty is going to be communicating with the sun. There's going to be different information that he's getting from the sun. And the sun sends out informations in various ways. One of the ma main ways is coronal loops. This is how information is sent out from the sun. So you literally have the Aten, which is the solar disk. And everybody thinks that Akhenaten is worshipping the solar disk. And they're actually wrong when they say that, Karen. Mm -hmm. Because Akhenaten isn't worshipping the solar disk. He was worshipping the light that was emanating from the disk. That's what really it means. When you talk about Ak Inaten, it means the intelligence that's coming from the sun. That's what he changed his name to. His name was Amenhotep IV, but he changed it to Akhenaten in like the seventh or ninth year of his reign. And it's literally trans, it could be Ku Inaten or Ak Inaten, which both mean the intelligence of the light of the sun. So he's literally talking about the intelligence coming off the sun, the light, that's the coronal mass ejections, and the arm of the sun is literally holding an onk coronal loop. And that loop is being passed down to the breath of the solar king, opening up a doorway of information and light for even souls to travel on. Like the little one is offering itself up to the loop. So... Possibly the little one was sacrificed to the sun and it's opening up a doorway for it to travel on the Corona loop, right? So this is the more logical explanation. They even have the little snake, right? The little snake right here yeah. that um, they call it uh, the asp, the the basilic in Greek, in Greek, the asp. That little snake is always portrayed at the bottom of the sun or over the third eye. Right. That's the way electricity travels through the plasma. It travels like snakes, like the Naga. Mm -hmm. Right. It tra That's the way it all travels. Right. So that is literally talking about the electricity traveling through the plasma waves, the snakes, the information traveling through the plasma waves and how it's sent from the sun. So when you see a deity holding the onk loop, the deity represents the sun. It's the solar deity and it's carrying the onk to the planet. Right. I mean, it's 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 very simple. It's not that complicated. It's actually very deep, poetic science talked about in a very spiritual way. Mm -hmm. It's very beautiful, actually. And most likely uh, most of the dynasties didn't understand the secrets of nature in the universe that way. And they didn't, you, did, you know, and I think during certain dynasties, the knowledge was awakened within them. Right. Just like some things are being awakened in me. Mm -hmm. Well, certain people get things awakened in them. And I feel that in the later 18th dynasty with Akhenaten's father, Amenhotep III, that's when some of this knowledge re-emerged and was brought back and a splendor was brought to the later 18th dynasty, right? Uh, 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 it was like a re-emergence of knowledge and activity and technology. So Amenhotep III, in my opinion, was the one that sparked that Atonism. And then his son, Akhenaten, took it to a new extreme mm -hmm. and took it even further. Right. So uh, there's there's a, there was also another brother of Akhenaten that reigned for a little bit. But that's going on a whole nother whole nother thing. But I mean, things get awakened within people. I mean, there's some people that will tell you the Ankh is a freaking sandal. <laughs> like a, 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 a desert shoe. Right. Because of its shape that a foot can sit like almost like a, a snowshoe in a way, but like a desert, like an Eskimo shoe. But for the desert. Yeah, right. There's yeah. some people. Oh, yeah. You think one of the most sacred symbols of the gods had to do with that? I don't think so. It's a solar symbol. It's a and it's a cosmic symbol. And, and the uh, and I'll show you here if I could share screen. Let me just sure. uh, pull it up first for a second. Let me let me. Uh, you should be able so, to share 
Yeah, let me just get it up first so you guys don't see all my other stuff. All right. So while you're doing that, I just want to ask you, so the All right. ancient Vedics, that predates the Egyptians. Oh, hell yeah. And and so, they're, they, they're the ones that understood everything, used plasma physics. They had different ways of attracting the energy and using it. And then there was a war and then they split into a whole, all the sort of subgroups that we have seen throughout history. Is that? Is yeah, that Karen, all these, all these cultures you can trace back even all the words they use, the titles of their gods, their 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 sacred spots, you could trace it back to Vedic ancient Sanskrit. So like when you have Osiris, Osiris is part of the Asuras, right? So Osiris is Osiris is a Greek, more of a Greek name, but Osiris's name in Egyptian is Asar. A-S-A-R. That is from the Asuras. This is where you get Assyrian, mm -hmm. right? This is where you get the Ahura. Mazda. It's just the sound shift of the word. Mm -hmm. It's the same word. Ahura Mazda is the Asura, right? So the Ahura of Persian. When you have the Assyrians, those are Asura. So you have the Devas and, and the Asuras. The Devas seem to be like the some of the Egyptian, uh, I mean, the, the Zeus and, and some of those gods seem to be more of the Devas. Then you have the Asura clans, which were more the warriors. And, and the Devas were more the, the shaman priests. So you have these splits and all of these cultures. I mean, even the Mitanni were an ancient culture that were in the northern Syria area that were like these Mad Max chariot warriors, right? <laughs> they were really incredible. And some of them were very big and uh, they had black hair and, and bluish green eyes, many of them. And they spoke almost pure Sanskrit. Some of the writings that we have and they and they and they intermarried with Egyptian royalty pharaohs the mitanis they were they were bringing their 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 women and to, to intermarry with amenhotep the third right so this is where uh tutankhamun's famous alien dagger originated from that mm -hmm. where he has the meteorite iron in his dagger mm -hmm. it was given to him by to amenhotep the third who was his grandfather originally by a mitanni king and it's talking about in the in the amarna letters they talk about it right so um Right here, what we, we we show about here. So all those all those groups were derived all over, even in Sardinia. I mean, everywhere you can find Vedic origins. The Phoenicians, uh, everywhere, everywhere. I mean, from Native American to Japanese to Chinese to African, all of them come from ancient Vedic Sanskrit bloodlines. They were they had colonies all over the planet. Mm -hmm. And I think ancient India, that area was one of their main hubs originally. Mm -hmm. And they spread out from, there was no Aryan invasion. There was an Aryan division. They divided and they spread out all over. And right here, what we have is the NASA Goddard's uh, photograph of a coronal mass ejection loop. These are coronal loops. Yeah. And this is uh, in scale to the size of Earth. So you can see how massive they are. And so this is Varuna, right? Varuna is, as you see, he is the god of the solar ocean and he's traveling on a crocodile, right? So the solar ocean is a very swampy place with a lot of particles, but also our third dimension is a very swampy realm. As you get higher, it gets more clear, more serene, more vivid, more alive. Just like when you dream, you're slightly in a higher dimension. It's more vivid. It's more bright. When you come back from a dream, what you left felt like it was more real than this reality. You're like, wow, what I just left was more real. Like, yeah. whoa. Yeah, because you were in a slightly higher, more vivid, more bright, more serene, more clear dimension. Oh, as you get more towards the earth, it's swampy. Now, a crocodile rules the swamp. So you'll see a lot of crocodile imagery when it comes to gods. And it has to do with our third dimension and going to and bringing things to earth so you have varuna who's the god of the solar ocean traveling on the back of a crocodile so he's the the solar deity all his different arms hold different aspects of the sun he's carrying his water jug and he's carrying his pasha 
his Varuna Pasha, his coronal mass ejection loop, right? So this is the Pasha in Vedic. And this is described as a golden noose that comes from the sun, lassos souls, and pulls them into the celestial waters. And now you can see this is described almost exactly like the coronal loop. And it's held by all the solar deities. This is Ganesha holding the loop, right? And he's representing the sun. Look, he's even red. He's holding, he's got various arms, you know, it's the whirling vortex of the sun, right? So all these deities are holding and showing all the secrets and of, of nature and the universe. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a critical aspect of these solar deities. And uh, it's actually goes even deeper. Like I showed you with the Egyptian. Um, let me see if I have it. I might even have the the Akhenaten. Yeah, see, this is the Akhenaten one. So you, this is actually the papyrus that I was showing you, but clearer. Oh, you know, yeah. so look at it's literally the arm of the sun is handing down a coronal loop to its solar king. I mean, I mean, you can't get more better science description than that. How else would you show it in a two dimensional way? Mm -hmm. they also have exact so they have everybody's familiar with the book of the dead but you have other precursors to the book of the dead like the book of gates the book of caverns the book of two ways all these books and they all describe these regions called the Ots. these regions are regions within our magnetosphere they even describe and show a two-dimensional description of our magnetosphere that's exactly like our two-dimensional description of our magnetosphere Right in the hieroglyphics. I have found, not just from research, because you can't, Karen, you can't decipher these ancient symbols from academics and scholarship alone. These were not intended for scholars. These were intended for adepts and spiritual initiates. So the, the scholars might be able to translate what the hieroglyphic word might mean, but not what it's spiritually and scientifically veiling and hiding within it what it's encoded with and that's what the spiritual initiates and adepts know, like that were trained in right they knew what these actual symbols were were encoded with what they really meant and what they were hiding within it right so nowadays you can't you can't like we weren't even supposed to see these these were meant for spiritual initiates adepts and certain priests to enter into these temples, yep. not for the average scholar or man to see them at all, right? So a scholar is not meant to be able to translate this right. And unfortunately, nowadays, we don't have any ancient adepts or spiritual initiates around to say it. So the only way we're going to get these true definition of these ancient symbols is if some of us have the memory, the genetic memory or the imprint of an adept or spiritual initiate. And sometimes when we have near-death experiences or we go through trauma or uh, a kundalini activization or some sort of spiritual significant event, that knowledge can be brought to the surface and it might take us years to translate and figure out. Wow, that's super interesting. Now, I'm wondering if um, you can segue that into talking a little bit about crystals because I know you also work with uh, crystal skulls and crystals and you create very powerful um, jewelry. It's not really jewelry. It's not meant for adornment. It's meant for spiritual enlightenment, I understand. Can you- Yeah, can you if, I, if, I, if I was making it for only jewelry, it would be a hell of a lot more fancy. So yeah. maybe you can talk, you know, segue a little bit about, uh, you know, about, about that because that's well, also very interesting and tied into the topic. Yeah, for sure. Definitely is. Well, you know, crystals and metals are natural elements that are very powerful, right? So certain, I like to work with copper. Uh, if I had, if I, maybe if I expand in the future, I might be able to work with gold and, and silver more, but I work with typically copper, sometimes silver um, and gemstones and crystals. So crystals retain information. They uh, they collect information. They store information. They're piezoelectric. They have electricity. I can even show you. I've done it on certain videos where if I shut the lights out, I could show you. If you rub two crystals together, it sparks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So they're piezoelectric. 
right? So uh, certain things like tourmaline, even Rochelle salt, uh, uh, quartz, these Quartz are peaches. for sure. And the whole Yeah. quartz family, a lot of people don't realize amethyst is quartz and, and citrine Yeah. is also quartz and so Yeah. many semi-precious Yeah. stones that we love so much are all in the quartz family. They're highly For sure. piezo piezoelectric. Yeah, when you when you compress or squeeze quartz, rub it together, compress it, squeeze it, it it generates cold plasma light, piezoelectricity. It's cold light. It's cold plasma, right? So it opens up doorways of light. So when you have a lot of these structures that are made of granite that have high quantities of crystal inside of it and also magnetite, you got electricity and magnetism going on at the same time. And these granite structures usually have a circular formation or uh, circular stones around them and things like that where they're generating a toroidal movement around them and they're built on top of Uh, underground water and underground fault lines and places of natural shocks and, and vibrations generated that squeeze and compress the quartz that open up a doorway of light. And there's archaeoastronomy alignments on specific times of the year, like winter solstice. So that doorway of light will be aligned with the sun's light. And it's a bridge from that spot to the other for information, for beings, for whatever to come through. Right. So these are very, very ancient sacred technologies that we're only rediscovering now. So when you have a copper coil wrapped around quartz, you're literally forming a toroidal energy movement around the court. It's compressing and squeezing it. It's opening up a doorway of light, right? So you literally are walking around with a doorway of light uh, always. And when, when you twist the copper, like I do here, this is cut from the sacred royal cubit, which actually vibrates at a harmonic frequency of 144 Hertz, which is a harmonic light speed. So this is uh, when it's sque when it's twisted clockwise, the copper, right? That when you got a normal piece of copper, it's got a north and south pole, positive and negative charge. But when you twist it clockwise, it's like wringing out a dirty sponge, and you're you're actually wringing out all the dirty electrons. So it's a positive charge in the copper, always a positive explosion of fresh electrons. And then you make it in a, a, a ring or a coil. So you have that constant flow of energy. So when you have a ring of twisted copper, you literally have a, a divine light that's flying out the middle, but it's it's real physics, it's real science, right? So you literally are making it so there's an explosion of electrons, fresh electrons always coming from the copper. So if you have a, a broken bone, a cut, a tummy ache, whatever, it'll give you a fresh explosion of electrons to help heal it quicker, right? So it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's real science. It sounds woo woo because we say mind, body, and soul, but it's not woo woo, right? There's nothing woo woo around it. It's real science, Mm hmm right? The twisted copper is the more powerful of it. So even this, the, the shapes of the harmonizers, this is the same shape that our magnetic fields generate in the same shape that supernova explosions explode in, right? These, these, so they generate literally it's a, it, When you pull negative energy, it pulls negative energy down into the bottom of the coil and positive energy comes out through the top. So you have a constant vacuum of sucking in the negative and putting out the positive. So you're pulling out the negative and putting a constant explosion of positive electrons always. So that's what the copper really does. And for me doing a lot of, for me having a lot of psychic activity happening and me doing a lot of spiritual work, helping clearing other, this and that, having a family Now, being a father, I need a protection boundary from all these harmful er elements, even EMF. So by using shungite and copper coils and certain crystals, uh, you're able to not just form a protection, a shield, but you can work with them in various ways as well. I don't suggest people that are in that are not grounded individuals to start working with crystals in a in a in a in a in a way where you're putting thought forms in them. You can Right. use them for healing and things like that, but you have to be a real grounded individual if you want to take it to another step. Because I've taken it to steps where you can even use crystals, especially crystal skulls, to scry your past lives. I know scrying, if you're a Christian and things like that, they think it's evil. Well, it's not evil. What is evil is if you're a bad person. So anything could be evil, Karen. I Mm-hmm. mean, Yeah. I, I guarantee you if Jesus... 
real Jesus that we talk about, if he was really here right now, he'd probably wear an amethyst necklace. Yeah. Right. Everything right? But has everything has both the sacred. A and piece the of quartz. A piece of quartz is not evil. Right. But yeah. if you put a thought form of evil thought into it. Yeah. Then it can be evil, just like a, a, a pen. I could write you a beautiful poem, but I could stab you in the neck with it, too. Yeah, it's the same. Right? Anybody who wields it depends on who's willing. It. Is all is there? It's just what do we bring out? You know, what do we bring out? What is it's our whoever's intention? wielding the object? Any yeah. object can be used for good or bad. Yeah. You know, and and it depends on who's wielding it. And if you're a bad person, yeah, bad things are going to happen if you start working with crystals because you're a bad person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But if you're good, there's good is going to emanate from you. Mm -hmm. It's only it's it's you know so yeah there don't be scared of crystals I mean most for most people they're just pretty little lumps of minerals on their desk or whatever mm -hmm. but they go way beyond that their beauty the reason why you get drawn to them is because your body is responding to the energy mm -hmm. you know your body is responded to a certain color a certain frequency or a certain vibe about it right that's your you, people don't listen to their bodies anymore. And they're and they're they they tend to start sensationalizing people. You know, most people, oh, I'm being attacked today. No, you need to eat a freaking salad and exercise. Yeah. Yeah. You're not being attacked. All right. Your your body is talking to you. It's your diet and your activity, mostly. You know, yeah. you're not being attacked. You're aging and you got poor fucking <laughs> diets, you know. So people sensationalize things and they want to make it more more well, supernatural than it that is that way they don't have to take personal responsibility responsibility and yeah being a good person means you have to take personal responsibility so i'm curious to know so the different items that you sell in your store what can they be used for what what would a person be looking for that would uh, be helped by what you what you make i mean you can use them from everything from jewelry to healing to dowsing Mm -hmm. um all of that i mean you can use them for healing purposes all every crystal each day of the week each mood you have every every little vibe you have has a different crystal a gr different color crystal different energy different vibration and the same with copper i mean copper is basically used for protection from emf mm -hmm. from reduce of fatigue uh reduce of stress I mean, right here, I was dealing with a little bit of a toothache earlier, and I, I have this, literally a face mask of a Faraday cage of twisted copper. And if even if I have allergies, within a few seconds of putting this on, it starts to clear up. Because And this will pull mucus out of your lungs as well, right? You get mucus in your lungs, even if you don't smoke, just from sugar, mm -hmm. things like that. So like, uh, yeah, copper is very strong. I was inspired heavily in the 1990s by Slim Sperling. I graduated high school in 95. In that year, I I I started uh I think it didn't, I think it was either 95 or 96 that I got introduced to Slim Sperling. And uh maybe it was 96. But uh somewhere around 95 96 90 Yeah, it was I think it was 96. Uh Slim Sperling. So Slim Sperling inspired me to start working with Copper more. Mm -hmm. Um, before that I had al already, already known about copper coils around crystals, but not about the twisted copper. Mm -hmm. Right. So, uh, after some spurling, I got inspired and in, uh, about 2012, 2013, I started twisting, doing the copper my, myself that way. And I actually have some of my own creations, you know, the, some of the, my models are inspired by some spurling, but I actually have some of my own inventions that slim spurling never came up with. Mm -hmm. I have the ear AccuVac one. I have different onk type devices that I, I made and different stuff like that. So I also have my own style of 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 doing the 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 wrapping around certain crystals and stuff too. Uh, I don't wrap around certain tech types like moldavite things like that. They seem to be too chaotic when you wrap copper coils around them. Mm -hmm. But I do wrap shungite, vivianite, um. Yeah, Shungite and Vivianite, I, I wrap, but not not uh, Moldavite. Mm -hmm. Moldavite, if you wrap a copper coil around them, they're they're kind of it's too chaotic of an energy. But I do mm -hmm. I do uh, I have wrapped like this one I recently made. This is a piece of Moldavite with uh, just a copper foil around the sides. Oh, it's beautiful. You know? 
and it has the uh yeah I'm, I'm thinking about if i should give this to my wife or if i should sell it <laughs> i'm wondering yeah it's a really nice big piece of moldavite mm -hmm. and just got the the silver That's, loop on top moldavite's there. also not that easy to come by nowadays too most of so. it's fake most yeah, of it's fake that's what i've heard if you're getting a piece of moldavite like this and it's under a hundred like it's under like four hundred dollars if it's like 40 bucks if you i've seen fake. people buy a, a big moldavite bracelet with all these big pieces of moldavite and they paid like 40 bucks for, i'm like no way that would be like six thousand dollars yeah or yeah. like sixty thousand dollars yeah you know there's it's they're mostly resin fakes yeah that's what I glass heard. fakes that's yeah what heard. most of them even with so, citrine even with citrine a little most citrine oh yeah is fake. a lot of citrine is just dyed like, so quartz. i'll show you the difference of citrine like so you have to have a high quality uh amethyst or uh high quality smoky quartz to actually make a really good uh so-called fake uh citrine some citrine is not even real crystal it's like you know but um not all heat treated is bad it's just an alchemical change to it but you got to know what you're buying yeah so this is uh a citrine that has been heat treated mm-hmm and it's a very, very high grade, triple A grade crystal, very, very high grade crystal, but it's been heat treated to have that yellow hue. Mm -hmm. I don't know how well you can see it. And then I'll show you what a real citrine looks like. So this is a nat, there's, these are two other natural. So this is a natural citrine that's more of a smoky, smoky citrine. Right. Yeah. And this is more of a yellow citrine that's natural. Yeah. This is a natural Brazilian citrine and this is the heat treated yeah. citrine. Yeah. When you got a natural citrine, the color is going to be pretty fluid throughout it. Right. When you have a, a when you have a heat treated citrine, it's it's like part of it will be yellow, part of it will be white. Uh, it'll be it'll be different. It'll be way different sometimes. But some of them you can't tell. You know, it's hard to tell sometimes with people. But mm -hmm. there's just certain yellows that you could tell is fake. You know, it's it's just. I mean, there's lemon quartz that looks that yellow. That's a gemstone quality that I have. But you know, for for some people, it's hard to tell. Like this is a lemon. I can show you what like a real lemon quartz looks like. That's a gemstone that looks similar to. That looks similar to the fake yellow citrine. But I mean, it's not fake crystal. It's a real crystal. It's just, it's way more expensive to get natural citrine. Way yeah. more expensive. Yeah. You know, and uh, whereas this is lemon quartz. So this is a lemon quartz gemstone. So this is a facet grade gemstone of lemon quartz. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. I have, mm -hmm. I have some of these. I wrap these with, with uh, copper as well. Mm -hmm. I have so a lot I really of want to um, recommend everybody check out your shop and see your creations. They're absolutely, absolutely yeah. beautiful. Even so have opal, opal gemstone skulls. Like this is an opal skull of rhyolite, fire matrix in, on rhyolite. This is an opal skull. Oh, yeah. Really cool here. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. So we're quickly running out of time, Rob, but I want you to um, tell people where they can find you. Um, some of the people will be listening to this on audio. Of course, they can check the description below, but it's nice for them to hear where uh, where they can reach you. Sure. You can find me at the mystical spiral store.com for my products. Or if you want the free information website, it's the mystical spiral.com. The mystical spiral store.com goes to my store. If you go to the mystical spiral.com, you can find everything. My store is a link to that as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm also on Patreon, patreon.com. Yeah, what, what can people expect from your Patreon? Oh, I have all my research on there. I got uh, exclusive access to videos. We do live shows all week that they're not aired anywhere else, but on Patreon, they're Zoom. So uh, all week long for literally $2, as low as $2 a month. There's other tiers. Where the higher tiers, you get like crystal packages each month in the mail and things like that. But if you you can literally join the lowest tier for less than a cup of coffee in a month for two dollars, and you get life changing information research. I post almost every day on there. 
either uh, at least a, a picture of a megalithic site or description of something or an article I wrote or a video. Yeah. You know, so tonight I'll be live on there at 930. Um, we're going to be talking about Crystal Skull scrying and how uh, I, I was shown a, a, a city in space. And it was very similar, actually, to a, 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 a satire. They said it was a satire picture. But some say it was a real picture from the Hubble telescope in the 90s. Mm -hmm. That was showing a city in space, like a city of God. I was shown very similar something s similar in scrying with crystal skulls. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in Nick Nosorino, who's passed now, he was like the OG of crystal skulls in the 80s. Uh, when he did this book, uh, do I have it? This was a classic book back in the day. Uh, you can't get it no more. But I actually, this is a signed copy that was my mom's uh, signed from the author. Can you see that yeah, was signed by one of the authors, oh, yeah. Sandra? Yes. Yeah. This is a, this is a great book. Mysteries of the crystal skulls revealed. And it's with the late Nick Nosorino, my friend, Joshua Shapiro and Sandra Bowen, Joshua I've had on my show before that little city there that they show is a Tibetan monastery of one of the monks, but also the crystal skull of Mitchell hedges was showing them little cities inside of the skull as mm -hmm. well. So Check out right here. And that's on, at 9.30 uh, Eastern time tonight, right? Yeah, check out um, real quick before you go. Check out this real quick when I share screen. Okay. This is the NASA, supposed the NASA Hubble city in space. Right here. Wow. Very similar to the Tibetan monastery and the city that I was shown scrying. Now, they're trying to say that this city in space was just a satire article that it wasn't real, but NASA never truly responded to it. And it was supposedly snuggled out of NASA from the Hubble telescope in the nineties before it was fixed. So, and yeah, this was the other night of the statue of Liberty, February 24th, 2024, 224, 24. This was shown over the, the torch of the statue of Liberty, the full moon, which represents Demeter, looking for her lost Persephone when she lights her torch with Mount Etna, the volcano. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be talking about that as well. Yeah, 930 tonight, patreon.com slash the mystical spiral. Wonderful. Now, before we go, do you have any last words for the audience? No, I, I just want to say thank you for having me on. And it would be a pleasure to come on in the future as well, if you'd like to have me. I would love it. Thank you so much, because we barely scratched the surface of the the whole plasma physics and the ancients. Yeah. There's so much to talk about. We didn't about. even get into my near-death experience or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, we could do We could get into Yes, I'd love to have you back. Yeah. So, um, but we are, sadly, we are running out of time now. And it's 420 right now. Oh, it's not funny. For well, me, it is. It's it's actually 220 here, but 420 Eastern. That's awesome. Well, that's yeah. a good time to, to say goodbye. But I want to thank you so much for making the time to be on the show today. I appreciate you very much. I appreciate the viewers and the listeners. And uh, we'll see everybody next week on the Quantum Guide Show. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. It was a pleasure, Karen. Thank you for having me on your show. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for joining me for the Quantum Guide Show. Become the change that you wish to see in the world. Subscribe to my YouTube and other channels at Karen Holton TV. Click the like button, leave me a comment, and share this podcast with your friends. Check out my website at www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com to see my free resources and amazing products and services. All the links will be in the description below. As part of the Forbidden Knowledge Network, you will find the Quantum Guide Show with Karen Holton and also the Aliens and Angels podcast on all audio platforms. Until next time, keep up the good work.